Amen. Hey, listen, I'm so excited about the Word of God tonight. Um, I need to, so we have a, a dear, dear friend of mine, Jose Diaz, who, who drove in, no, I'm just kidding, he flew in all the way from Philadelphia to bring a word. Now, I need to tell you a little bit about Jose. Jose is, he, huh, he's amazing. He is a fiery man of God. He's been to like over 40 nations. He used to come to the ramp when he was in his youth group from Fort Myers, Florida, and just got set on fire, uh, traveled some with Jason Upton, traveled some with Rick Pino. He and Rick Pino started Heart of David, the ministry there. But listen, he is, was instrumental, uh, and we, me and him have connected. We've been to Israel together. We've been to the country of Azerbaijan together. We were supposed to meet the president, but that fell through, <laughs> and we're kind of bitter about it. But anyways, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 it works, yeah. So, it, yes, it's just been a wild prophetic journey. I'm so, God, I'm so glad that God saw fit to bring us together. But a couple of months ago, I was actually uh, maybe, I don't remember if it was June of this year, he calls me and he says, have you ever considered moving out of Hamilton? I'm like, nope, <laughs> why would I do that? My life's here, my family's here, my job's here, my everything's here, whatever, why have you considered moving? No, I haven't. Two weeks later, God speaks to me about moving. And uh, so before anybody knew anything, we made a secret trip to Cleveland, Tennessee, just to kind of drive around. There was no, we didn't attend a service. We didn't do any of that stuff. We didn't even tell my mother-in-law that we were here. You know what I'm saying? It was like so covert. As soon, I'm talking about as soon, it was night, as soon as we hit, our car hit Azusa Street, my phone rang. And I was like, babe, Lauren, it's Jose. And she says, just tell him to prophesy. So we answer the phone, and I said, Jose, don't say anything, just begin to prophesy. And he begins to prophesy over me and my wife about being catapulted into a new position. He said, you're going, you're going to be sent somewhere, and what you're going to do is uncap whales. I'm like, you know what? Some of this stuff, some of this stuff is just, it's so out there, it has to be God. We're in this whole prophetic swirl. So anyways, he's been instrumental in my own life. Listen, I, I want you to engage. You remember what Pastor Micah spoke on about this, you know, this thing here? And all it takes, you know, is just lean in. He's highly prophetic. And I want us to hear what God's placed upon his heart. He preaches, he teaches, he's got a revelation on worship and the, the priesthood that I want us to really glean from. So I know that we were in this season of worship, and I was like, you know what, if I can have someone come teach on worship, not just a worship leader, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't sing. Well, I do sing, actually. <laughs> I sing a lot. But anyways, listen, worship is not reserved for the worship leader or those that can sing. You get what I'm saying? So anyways, I want Jose to come, and I want us to give him a ramp welcome. I want you to stand to your feet and honor the man of God. I love you. Yes, Amen. Let, let's stay standing. Can we do that? Such an honor to be here with you, Brother Perry Stone. Been so impacted by your prayer life. So a lot of people have really powerful messages, but few people have really powerful prayer lives. And really, sometimes the thing that's really going to outlive you when you die is not so much your sermons, it's your prayer life, right? And, and sometimes I, I, I fear that we're just, you know, we're raising up this like podcast YouTube generation, right? And, and everybody has like a, a, it's like an inundation of messages and all these things, but who's, who's everybody's got a message, but who's got a prayer life anymore? Wait, do you understand? Everybody's got a, like, a little sermonette and a YouTube clip and a media team, but nobody's got a prayer life anymore, so I'm encouraged. Uh, not everyone, but you know, preachers, we hyperbolize. But I'm encouraged by your prayer life, so it's an honor to be here. And it's an honor to, just, just exciting. And I love Samuel. Love him. Love him. It's good when you're with people you love. 
Well, you know, I want to, I just want to start off by doing something, if, if we can do that, if that's okay. You know, I, I, when I called Samuel, I guess it was June, and I'm a little scatterbrained. We just had our first baby. She, she turned two months old yesterday. And I'm just scatterbrained. Um, so help us, Lord. Um, but when Samuel was talking about wells, or, or I called him about wells, and then tonight we were praying, I really believe that one of the wells that the Lord wants to awaken in this place, or he wants to, to, to uncap and to redig, is a well of worship. I just heard this phrase, well of worship, and what I felt the Lord was saying is that God wants to birth new songs out of this place to bathe the church, to bathe the global church. It's very specifically, right? It, it, this isn't songs so you can make an album to make money. And we're going to talk about this tonight. God's about to deliver the worship movement from being an industry and calling us back to being a priesthood. Right? I mean, like, like this thing was never about Spotify. It was never about hits. It was always about perfume, and we've, and we've lost that perfume element of worship. But I feel like there's something pure that God wants to d awaken and to dig in this place. And, you know, you, you got to dig for these things. You don't just find wells. You dig wells. Do you understand? Like, well, we will contend for, like, prophetic words, and we'll contend for dreams. But when was the last time we contended for songs? When was the last time we contended for a sound? We've just settled for, for, for singing everyone else's songs, and we've just settled for copying everyone else's sound. I mean, could you imagine if during the offering... I reached into the person's next to me pocket, took out their money, and gave it? No, but that's what we do every time we sing someone else's song. This is what we do. I mean, this is, we've raised up a culture that says, you don't even need intimacy with God to worship anymore. We'll go and seek him, and we'll just tell you what he's like, and you imitate it. And God wants to, I, I just feel like we're in this global season of global deliverance. Right? Like we've worshiped, and I love what Samuel's been talking about. We've been, we're going from worshiping from information to revelation. Right? Isn't just the God that I've heard about in a sermon, it's the God that I've seen. I mean, do you sing holy because you were told he was holy, or do you sing holy because you've seen him? I mean, do you understand that, like, like nobody told the four living creatures he was holy? Do you know that? The concept of a worship leader didn't even come, you know, 3,000 years of worship music history, if you started the Tabernacle of David, the concept of a worship leader doesn't even come to be until the 1960s. 3,000 years of worship history, and 50 years of it we've had worship leaders. And then the concept of a worship band doesn't even come to exist until the 1980s. What changed that we needed worship leaders? Let me, can I just say something? What we have today in worship has been more influenced by the Beatles than King David. We, we got, let that sink in for a second. We haven't seen Davidic worship yet. What happened in the 60s, what happened in the 80s, and we began to create all these new positions. I'm convinced is that we stopped looking at God. And so when we stop looking, right, like we, there's this like we're in a worship debt crisis in the earth right now. And the worship debt crisis is directly related to a revelation crisis. For the last 50 years, 10% of the body has been doing 100% of the beholding. And I believe there's something God wants to do here with awakening these new songs. Friends, I'm telling you, these songs are not going to come out of songwriting sessions. We're, we were doing this uh, Q&A one time. And so I'm not a worship leader, by the way. I'm probably the worst singer in this building. Well, I, I sing so bad I offend myself. It's just, <laughs> I'm really bad. I'm like, I'm like, God's like, you're going to teach on worship, but I'm going to make you a really, really bad singer. Like, you're going to be so tone deaf. No one, not even Benny Hinn can heal you. It's bad. I forget. Oh, well, anyways, we were doing this Q&A session, and someone said, well, yeah, how do you write songs? What, what's the songwriting strategy? 
And because and, and, and that's everybody wants the trick. How do we write it? the next big worship song so our church can be the next big elevation? Let me tell you how you write songs. You go have an Isaiah 6 encounter. Right? You go see him, and then you write what you see. But anyways, all, all night tonight during worship, I just, I just kept hearing this. Like, I feel like we just, we need to go, we need to go deep tonight. And un, we need to, un, like, if the word is uncap wells, then we need to start uncapping wells. Like, at, you know, at some point you do the word. So here's what I want us to do before, before the message. I feel like, just close your eyes tonight. I, I, I just kept hearing this all night during worship, that I just really want to be obedient. Now, I know you don't know me. I've got a Cuba hat on. I'm not a communist. My family's just from Cuba. But I, what, what I want us to do tonight, I really want you to do this with me tonight. Don't just do it to do it. I want you to go deep into your belly tonight. And I just kept hearing this all night during worship. I want you to go deep. And I want you to let something just come out of you. I just feel like we need to find that sound and find that song. There's a, it's, you know, when King David established the tabernacle of David, he said, we're not going to tune the instruments the same way everyone's tuned them. We're going to find a whole new free. They discovered a whole new frequency. What if God wants to awaken a whole new frequency out of this place tonight? What if, what if, what if God's about to, what if, what if God's, what if this whole year has been about detuning because God's about to retune the whole worship movement? And what if God, I just, I just keep hearing this phrase, what if God would have raised this, what if God would have raised this community up as a global tuning fork? What if God would have raised something up out of here? That would be, I just see this like the Lord. It's like, it's like you've been the Lord's hidden instrument in his pocket. I don't know if you've ever seen those, those tuning forks. And I just, I just see like the Lord like beginning to strike and there's this vibration. There's this sound. And I believe that what's getting ready to come out of this place is global vibration. It's this global sound that's going to beckon the global church to tune itself up to what God is releasing on the earth. What if the Lord did that? What if somebody, what if, what if this whole, was it 90 days you've done this, right? What if this whole 90 days was about awakening a whole new sound? What if this whole 90 days was about a whole new frequency, right? King David, he, he, they, they literally invent new instruments. What if God is getting ready to release something? What if this is it? Like, I, I don't know, I just, what if this 90 days is about this well of worship that God wants to uncap? So here's what, I, this isn't hype. I just want you to go deep tonight. And I want you to let something out deep out of your belly that you've not gone to before. And let's just do that for a few minutes. So you just, whatever you're ready, just start. Come on, just awaken a sound. Now, come on. Yeah, yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah, come on. Come on. Come on, God, awaken a sound out of this place. Come on. Come on, we're not there yet, but we're on our way there. Come on, keep going. I want you to keep digging tonight. Come on, Lord, we're digging a well of worship in this place tonight. We're digging a well of worship, God. Father, we're asking you tonight for something to be awakened of a sound of worship. Father, new songs to come out of this place. It's a global, it's this global tuning fork that's going to release these vibrations all over the earth that's going to resonate. God, I see it shaking nations, shaking Muslim nations, God. It's a sound. It's this whole sound coming out of this place, God. Come on, just take a minute. Come on. Come on, it doesn't have to be words. It can literally be an O. But just let it come out of you tonight. Come on, let that thing just come out of you tonight. Come on, just another minute. Come on. Come on, keep going tonight. When new songs, new sounds, new songs.
God, new sounds, new songs, new sounds, God. God, the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the glory of the former house. God, new, there's a whole new songs, new sound. God, I'm asking right now, out of this place, new songs, new sound in Jesus' name. 30 more seconds. Come on. Come on, baptize us in worship. Baptize us in worship tonight, God. Baptize us in worship tonight, God. We want to worship the Lord. Come on, if you believe that, just shout amen tonight. Amen. 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 Yes. Yes. Amen. Well, you can be seated. It's an interesting thing, not being able to lead worship and teach on it. Because a lot of times I get scheduled to, people just assume you lead worship. So I get scheduled to lead worship all the time. Right. One time I was going to Denmark. I don't speak Danish, but I eat them. <laughs> and, 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 and I was just getting ready to get on the plane. And I said, man, I wonder what the graphic says. And they had me scheduled to lead worship three times. And I called the guy and I said, if I do that, I'll ruin your ministry. But I think we're, we're, we're living in a real, I mean, you, you, just, you don't have to be a prophet. You just turn on the television. We're living, I think, in one of the most critical times in human history. And I think it's a lot bigger than the White House. Do you know that God's answer for America isn't Donald Trump? Do you know that God's answer for America is the same answer for every nation in the world? It's Jesus. I mean, do we, like, like, do we still believe that kind of thing? I mean, God forbid. I, I'm not, this isn't, I don't have a word from the Lord on, on the election. I just have, I walk my dog and I think to myself at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> I, that's honest. That, that, that's, I, that's, that's like not hyperbole. That is the truth. I walk my dog and I just think, and I said, man, what if Donald Trump was the best thing for America, but Joe Biden was the best thing for the gospel? What would we rather have? I mean, I wonder, like, what if, like, if, like, what if the best thing for capitalism was Donald Trump, but the best thing for the harvest was Joe Biden? What would we rather have? And are we living in a moment right now in this, I believe we're living in, like, this tension where we'd rather almost fight for civil liberty than spiritual liberty. Anyway, everybody wants to meet, but what's the point? Our meeting hasn't done anything. And we're in this, like, critical moment in human history. And listen, I don't, you know, everybody, did God send COVID, did, did Russia send COVID, did McDonald's send COVID. I don't know who sent COVID, but I do know this, God ain't stopping it. I mean, God has, I mean, like, everybody and their mothers have fasted and prayed. And God hasn't stopped it. And I wonder if, what if this, what if this holy global pause that we were in has been the answer of our prayers? I mean, like, what if, what if Jesus has shown up to the body of Christ globally and we don't like the form he's come in? Like, what if we're kicking against the goads right now trying to go back to normal? Like, I mean, like, what if, what if this is it? What if this was the beginning of a great awakening? I mean, and God forbid that God would move outside of the way we could so easily be in control. So I think we're in this critical moment, and I honestly believe it has everything to do with worship. I really, I really believe. I mean, like, God is serious about the worship of the church. I mean, like, I don't think this has anything to do with our preaching or prayer meetings. I really, really believe this has everything to do with God is about to awaken a priesthood in the church. 
And we've had prophets and we've had kings, but what we've lacked is priests. And I think we're in this global, I'll say, I remember, I don't know, it's maybe July, I was, I was up in the mountains in Pennsylvania. And, I, and, and this year, I mean, I, other than just COVID, other things that have been happening, it's been like the worst year of my life. It's been pretty rough, anybody else? And I said, God, I don't really think you like me. <laughs> what the heck? Like, I'm a missionary, Lord. I thought you'd really like me. And he said something so amazing. He said, you've been, you've been asking for a baptism of fire. This is the baptism of fire. And the Lord began to provoke me with, I mean, like, how many of us? We've been in the big stadium gatherings, and we've been in the big conferences and the big events. And we're like, God, if you shut everything down, and I was alone in my bedroom, I'd worship just as radical. Even if there wasn't 3,000 people, I'd still worship it. And then the Lord says, okay, I want to find out if you really mean what you say. I mean, what if this is, guys, what if God is actually testing our words right now? And what if what the flip side of this is the people that come out of this as the bright shining lamps weren't the people that were the voices before we went in? What if the people that come out of this as bright shining lamps were the people that worshipped in secret when everyone else was fighting to stay relevant? I'd be like, what if this is it? Like, what if we're in Matthew 25 right now? What if this is what Jesus was talking about? What if wisdom has nothing to do with your social media presence right now? What if wisdom had nothing to do with marketing, worshiping from home? What if wisdom had everything to do with worshiping God in secret? Many years ago, I don't know, maybe not that many, I don't know. I'm 31, everything feels like many. A few years ago, maybe it was many, I don't know. But I, I, was, I was, you know, we were doing this conference and people come to these events. And, you know, people come because you know, they want the tricks. They want to be, like, famous. That's like, you know, it's, it's really the truth. You know, they're all excited. They want the, you know, I teach you how to be a prophetic worship leader. It's like it's so records. And, I, and, and so the, the Lord prompted me with this, you know, rhetorical question and it was this and I said what if what if I called you out you know one of those like Paul Cain words of knowledge the Lord give me your social security and your pant size and all that stuff and I called you out and I said the Lord says over you you are going to be the greatest worship leader in your generation who would love that everybody you know what if the Lord said I am going to give you the most important worship songs in your generation What if the Lord said, I'm going to give you the songs that deliver a nation like the Philippines from sex trafficking. Millions of children are trafficked and abused sexually and fed a McDonald's hamburger a day. Everybody. But what if the Lord said you had to do it in private and you couldn't tell anybody about it? What if the Lord said you had to worship in your bedroom, you could never Facebook live it, You could never testify about it, and you had to work at Starbucks for the rest of your life, and no one but you and God would know what you did in your bedroom in the place of worship. But from your bedroom, with your guitar, you were literally discipling nations. Who would still want that word? Friends, I'm telling you, you mark my words. The next wave that is getting ready to come to the worship movement is the greatest wave I believe we've ever seen and it's going to be a whole generation of worship leaders you will never know their names and you will never hear their songs but you'll reap the fruit of their worship I mean do you understand that nobody has to hear you for your worship to be effective Do you understand that you don't need a platform for your worship to be affected? Do you understand we've never heard King David's worship, but we're still reaping the fruit of it? But do you understand? We don't even know what he sounded like. He probably had a horrible voice. Or too much vibrato. But if you like that, good for you. 
I mean, we don't know, but we, 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 like, we literally don't know, but we're reaping the fruit. I believe God is doing something right now so spectacular, but we're so desperate to get back out in the public. We're missing the revival that's happening in the private. So uh, just a few thoughts here. So I believe one of the things that God wants to do is he wants to teach us how to worship regardless of what's happening around us. I'm like incredibly concerned with how devastated people were on November 4th. I'm absolutely concerned. The level, do you understand that on November 4th when all, all of us were freaking out, do you understand that heaven didn't even skip a beat in its worship? Do you understand that when John is writing the book of Revelation and he gives us Revelation chapter 4, the great worship scene in heaven with lightning and thunder and, and a jasper stone, right? And, and many, many, many voices and four living creatures. Do you understand that he wrote that? that, that that's, when he sees that, we're beyond November 4th, 2020. Here's what we're told. Like the, the, the worship movement of, of the earth is too disconnected from the worship movement of heaven. Can, can I just provoke us with rhetorical questions? What if Donald Trump not winning is actually the mercy of God? I'm not saying that. I'm just asking questions simply to provoke us. What if God is delivering us from every false comfort and everything? What if we've been worshiping the wrong throne? But at some point in history, we're going to have to choose between the elephant, the donkey, and the lamb. And I'm not entirely sure Republican Christians would choose the lamb right now. I mean, what if this is like what we've been, I, I know it's crazy, don't throw rocks at me or whatever. Talk to Samuel after the sermon. <laughs> but I think about these things when I walk my dog. I'm like, God, what if we're so mad, but this is actually, the, what if this is the goodness of God? What if God is actually restoring worship in that we're not going to worship anything else anymore? So just again, more thoughts. So I believe one of the other things is God's restoring purity to the worship movement and the worship culture within the church. There's a purity that's coming back, and it's this. Worship was never intended by God to be the thing that prepared a room for a preaching. Do you see where we've missed it already? Do you, see, or do you see already why it's so easy for us to worship politicians? Because for the last you know, 50 years, we've been worshiping preachers. You're telling me the one thing that's God's is simply so we can prepare a room for a man. What's going to happen when the preaching is no longer the main attraction of a service, but the worship becomes the main attraction of the service? What's going to happen when the body of Christ isn't just a fine way good preaching? What's going to happen when the main identity of the global body of Christ is unceasing, 24-7 worship, not because it's a fad, but because we can't help ourselves? This isn't about, you know, we just got to get the anointing right and everything right. No, no, this has nothing to do with pulpits. Do you understand the four living creatures in heaven? They're not waiting for a preacher right now. They're not up there singing, waiting for somebody to come give a word. They're singing because they're seeing, and their seeing is provoking their singing. I believe we're coming into a global Malachi 111 moment. Let's go to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi 1.11. Malachi Echad. Malachi 1.11. 
I've been saying this for the last few months. I believe right now the most prophetic, this is my opinion, the most prophetic book in the Bible right now to the body of Christ is the book of Malachi. Here's why. The entire book is written to the worship and prayer movement in the day of Malachi. Right? It's a whole book addressed to the priesthood in the days of Malachi. Now, now, I, you know, I don't want to get into all this tonight, but just a little newsflash. If you are a born-again believer, you are a priest in the priesthood of Jesus, which is in the order of Melchizedek. We're going to maybe touch on that in a second. But I want to tell you, you are not a Levite. We love Levite language, but I'm going to tell you something. Jesus didn't die to keep us in the Levitical system. He died to bring us into something greater, and it's the priesthood of Melchizedek. So everybody in this room is a priest. And if we're priests, that means that we have a responsibility to partner with God for the stewardship of the earth. Priesthood is more to do with just, you know, getting lost in the presence. It has everything to do with responsibility and stewardship. Let me just give you a quick verse and then we'll look at this. I love this verse. Psalm 115 verse 16. I believe it's one of the clearest pictures of the function. I know I didn't give the guy. I'm sorry. But I'll quote it to you. Psalm 115, verse 16. It's one of the clearest pictures of one of the functions of the priesthood. And David says this. He says, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he's given to the sons of men. Here's what this means. God is saying, in the same way that I steward the heavens, I've created you to steward the earth. It's called priesthood. So see, the, the, the purpose of worship is partnership with God unto the stewardship of the earth. We're going to look at this a little more clearly in a second. But I want you to get this. God is expanding our vision of worship. We're doing so much more, than, like I said, than singing songs to prepare for a message. We are actually partnering with God to prepare the earth, not only for a great harvest, but to see Jesus enthroned in Jerusalem, ruling over the nations and receiving them as his inheritance for his faithfulness. Do you understand that one song out of your mouth has more weight and authority than a thousand riders in the streets? I'll tell you a story. We were, we were in Bogota, Colombia, on our way to a church to go you know, teach this stuff. And in the middle of the drive to, to um, um, the church, a riot broke out. Now, this isn't an American riot. This is a South American riot. These guys are for real. <laughs> they know what they're doing in Latin America. Just ask all my relatives. I mean, and just within a second, on the highway, the whole thing gets shut down. And, and, and so we're on this bus, and I'm leading all these young people on this missions trip. I'm like, oh, God, I don't think any of them filled out their forms. <laughs> Anybody ever led? <laughs> Anybody overseas? And we're in this bus, and to the right of us is a sidewalk, and to the left is all this block traffic. We can't go anywhere. And you're in this, you know, you're in that little moment of, oh, what do we do? And it's immediately God's like, well, go do the thing you teach them. Start singing. Start singing. They don't have to hear you. Just start singing. So, what, you know, we stood up and we said, okay. You know all that stuff we taught you for three months? Let's find out if it's true. Start singing. It's on video. I'm not lying. And so we start singing. Within 30 seconds, right in front of our bus, they just parked. And I look at that driver and I said, I don't care. Don't stop for anything or anyone. Just go. <laughs> and one little dude, he was extra radical. He jumped right in front of us. You know, he's like, you're not going anywhere. And then I got up and I go, in the name of Jesus, get out or I'm running you over. And he got out of the way. <laughs> but I sang it to him. It's a true story. But listen, but here's what I'm saying. There's weight and authority in our worship. There's weight and authority in our songs. If it's so much more than singing what's popular, if it comes out of a place of revelation and encounter. I believe the reason our worship is so powerless today I mean, here's what I mean by that. How many songs do you think we sing on any given Sunday in America? 
And you're telling me God's enthroned on the praises of his people? Either God's a liar or we're not praising. There's, there's a breakdown. Something's not adding up. David gets, you know, 288 singers and 4,000 musicians. And in the very next chapter, God says, and God gave David rest from all his enemies. There's, 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 a, there's a major disconnect in worship today and the biblical example of worship. And the disconnect is God isn't showing up the way the Bible tells us he would. And I believe the reason is, is because we've lost the spirit of revelation in our worship. We don't know the God we're worshiping. The power has, is not in the style. The power is in the revelation. So the book of Malachi, he's prophesying to the priesthood, so it's relevant. Do you understand? The priesthood are not the worship team. The priesthood is the church. The church is Revelation 1, right? Jesus died to give his father a kingdom of priests. God's government operates on the earth through priestly ministry. If there is no priesthood, there is no kingdom of God on the earth. We're putting all of our stock in politicians and God's trying to awaken a priesthood. And so Malachi, I'm going to paraphrase the summary of the book in today's vernacular. God is looking at the priesthood in the day of Malachi, and here's what he's saying in today's vernacular. He's saying, everything you sing about me is true. And I'm paraphrasing the book. He says, you know, everything you sing about me is true. Everything you say is true. Everything you do, in essence, is right, but I have an issue what you sing isn't the reality of your heart, therefore it's perverted. That's the message of the book in today's vernacular. He's talking about animal sacrifice. And you, you obey the law, you do everything right. You've gone through all the worship trainings. And you've bought all the e-courses and you've done all this stuff. You've got all the songs and you've got all the sound. But what you're lacking is revelation and what makes it pure is revelation. Therefore, it's perverted. This is his message. And then here's what blows my mind. In Leviticus chapter 6, God gives the priesthood a mandate. And he says this, the fire on the altar has to stay burning. It's a mandate. That's the law. Look at Malachi 1.10. To the one before 11. Malachi 1.10. God says, who is there even among you? He's saying, who's got the guts? Who's got the chutzpah? Who says, who is there even among you who would shut the doors? God's saying, who would do me the favor and shut the whole thing down? So that... You would not kindle fire on my altar in vain. God is literally saying, I wish somebody not had the prophetic unction to understand that right now, even though my law says keep the fire burning, it would be better to shut the whole thing down and don't come back till you get revelation. We're in Malachi 1.10 right now, guys. God has shut the whole thing down, and he's saying, don't come back until you're not doing it to build your brand on the earth. He literally tells them a few verses later, says, here's my issue. The priesthood was supposed to be a privilege. It's become a job title. Don't come until it's no longer a job title, until it's a privilege again. I mean, he literally tells him, you're grieved with me because now it's a job. But when I called you to be priest, it was supposed to be an inheritance. Friends, that's, we're in a crisis. People aren't worship leaders. I'm not everyone. I know I'm speaking in generalities, but you have to understand. I mean, like I've been in the industry. People don't worship the Lord anymore because they love Him. They worship the Lord because it makes money. God is a job description now. Worshiping God is a job and no longer a privilege and an inheritance. 
You know that verse where Jesus says, agree quickly with your adversary while you're on the way? I really believe right now the adversary to the worship movement is Jesus. And we're in this Malachi 1.10 moment. He says, listen, shut the whole thing down. I'd rather you not come and keep doing what you're doing than keep doing it. He says, do you not not kindle fire on my altar in vain? Now here's, you know, Jesus, he's the great encourager. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. Don't you love him? He's so cute. No, here, here's, 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 the, here's the point, and, and, and I hope you take this. I cannot judge your worship, but God can, God will, and God does, and I believe God has. And so God said, pause. Every, you know, everybody, one of the number one questions when you teach on the Tabernacle of David is, well, what does Selah mean? Nobody knows, but I think we're in one. I think we're in this global Selah moment. We're in this, like this is Selah. We're in the Selah. And God's saying, I'm not going to let you out until you find me again. Do you understand? Let me just paint this picture. Do you understand? Most of the Psalms by King David are not written in the tabernacle of David. They're written in the cave. You need to get this tonight. Psalm 63 is written in a cave. Psalm 27 is written in a cave. Psalm 23 is written in a cave. All of those things are written in quarantine. Do you understand? All of it is written in quarantine under an ungodly king with no presence. If you can't find, if Biden becomes president, and you can't get oil, you were worshiping the wrong God this whole time. I mean, do you understand? You do, we don't need Trump to get oil. All we need is to prepare a place for the Lord, even in the cave of a... Do you understand the whole idea of prophetic singers and musicians? This whole tabernacle of David is birthed in a cave under an ungodly king with no ark? All and all of that moment is to bring David to Psalm 27. It's one of the most profound statements, I think, of the whole Bible. This is a man who's hiding in a cave with a promise from God to be a king. And he's being persecuted by his spiritual father, Little open parentheses. Do you know why God said, thank God for the people that try to kill us? Because here's why. God sends Saul to David to kill the Saul in the heart of David. So here you got David in the cave, right? Malachi 1.10, shut the whole thing down. If I let you be king now, you'll just become another Saul. So he sends him in a cave. And he gets to this, the climax of the cave is Psalm 27, verse 4. And he gets to the end of this whole thing and he says one thing. One thing have I desired of the Lord and that one thing will I seek. I mean, you, it's maybe 10, 13 years of in the pressure in the pressure of persecution, in the pressure of quarantine, in the pressure of I can't put my trust in politicians or anything, you get to the point where now you've boiled everything down to saying this, if I can get one thing from you, this is all I want. He could have said, if you could give me anything, get me out of this mess. I don't even even care if I become king. Get me out of this mess. Do you understand that David, scholars say, sends his family to another country for fear that Saul was going to kill him? He could have said, if you give me anything, spare my family. But he doesn't ask for that. He could have said, you made me a promise. I'm in this mess because you anointed me. I wasn't even praying for it. I didn't even know about this. I was out and I wasn't even invited to the meeting. You did this. This is all your fault. Don't be a liar. Do what you said and make me king. Because God forbid that the prophets are false. That's not what he says. He says, 
something clicks inside of David and he gets to the end of himself and he says, no, 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 one thing have I desired of the Lord and that one thing will I seek. One thing have I desired of the Lord and that one thing will I seek. One thing have I, this is, you've so killed me, I've got one thing left. If you give me anything. Give me the ability to live in your house and behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire of your temple. If you give me anything, give me. You know what he, you know what he was praying for? Give me priesthood. David's prayer of Psalm 27, 4 is more than comfort, more than position, more than promise. Give me presence. More than position, more than platform, more than whatever. Give me priesthood. Give me nearness. I, and this is why I think it's so prophetic what you're on. I want to live my life to do on the earth what the four living creatures are doing in heaven. Can you give me just five more minutes? Is that cool? I don't know what time you are. I don't know. Do, do, do you understand? He's saying, he's saying, here's what I want. I, I realize that this has nothing to do with David becoming king. It had everything to do with David becoming priest. Friends, we're in a season. We're in this moment. And I'm telling you, when's COVID going to end? When we get to one thing. COVID's going to end when we don't even care if we get out or not, as long as we get the one thing. I mean, do you understand what's going to happen is we will we'll forget about the quarantine because we'll be so caught up in the presence that we'll come out and we'll do what David did. David becomes king. He reigns seven years in Hebron. After seven years, he conquers Jerusalem. All of the climax of David's life is to bring him. Seven years into his kingdom, David pitches a tent on the south side of Jerusalem. Pitches a tent, he prepares a place for the Lord, and he hires out of his own pocket 288 full-time prophetic singers, 4,000 full-time musicians, and 4,000 administrators, 8,288 full-time worship staff, $400 million a year budget, and they do it for 33 years, and they worship the Lord day and night. The, the tabernacle of David is the byproduct of a quarantine David. What if this whole thing was for God to so break us that what's getting ready to come to the earth is God is about to shoot out of caves all over the earth a whole new generation of Davids, a whole new generation of singers and musicians that are coming out with a song and a sound that will bring us to 2 Samuel 7 where God says, and he gave them rest from all of his enemies. Not because they built a great military, but because they built a great worship team. This Malachi one day. I mean, do you understand? 288 full-time singers, 4,000 musicians. They invent new instruments. And the, the chief priority, Israel finally stepped into its priestly identity. And God is so moved by this that we get to Amos chapter 9. And after nine chapters of prophesying cultural, spiritual, and political calamity, God says, I've got an answer. Do you understand we're living in a moment of cultural, spiritual, and political calamity right now? And God says, I've got an answer to this whole thing. It's not another preacher. Do you understand? It's not another preacher. It's not another Christian celebrity. It's not another 501c3. The Lord says, in that day, in that culture, in that moment, in that atmosphere, I'm going to rebuild David's tabernacle. God says, I'm going to restore not just the tent, I'm going to restore that same level of zeal and commitment that existed in the days of King David. I'm going to do it again. And all over the earth, I'm going to raise up a generation whose full-time focus is worshiping the Lord. Let's go to again, Malachi 1.11, real quick. I'm almost done, I promise. So he, Malachi 1.10, shut the whole thing down. Because it's in that place that we get the spirit of revelation back. 
Let me just say this. The whole tabernacle of David is modeled after the worship of the four living creatures in heaven. I love to ask people this. What do you think the four living creatures were created to do? Worship, worship. No, that's not what they... The four living creatures were created to look at God. That's why their whole bodies are covered in eyes. They're literally, their whole bodies within and without are covered in eyes. God created these four beings to give themselves to the full-time ministry of looking at God and being in all of what they see. Of what they see, the song is the byproduct of their beholding. They can't help but sing because they seek Him. And what they're singing is we've never seen anything like that before. And for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years, they've never changed the song, and it's never become a cliche because they've never lost the spirit of revelation. I could prove this to you biblically that David absolutely is taken up into heaven, and he sees this thing, and he says, you know what, let's do that on the earth. What if that's what Jesus meant when he said, on earth as it is in heaven? What if it had nothing to do with casting out demons? What if it had nothing to do with healing the sick? What if it had, it had everything to do with, if you want the kingdom of God on the earth the way they'd have it in heaven, then you better do on the earth what they're doing in heaven. Yeah. What, if, what if this whole on earth as it is in heaven has everything to do with worship and nothing to do with the working of miracles? Right. And really what it has to do with this, how do we teach people to worship? You teach them to see God and then sing what you see. So here's what happens. Malachi 1.10, shut the whole thing down. Go get revelation. And then we come out, and I believe this is what's about to happen. We're going to get sprung out of quarantine into Malachi 1.11. And he says this. For, and, and, and I love this. This is my brain walking my dog. This is how I picture it. God's angry. But then he stops and he says, but let me let you in on a secret. I want to tell you the dream of my heart. Everybody talks about their dreams. But guys, God's looking for a people that are willing to lay their dreams down and go after God's dreams. And God says, no, 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 I, I, I understand it's bad now, but I have comfort because there's a, there's a time coming where in Cleveland, Tennessee, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, my name is going to be great among the Gentiles. This is an amazing verse. He says, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, it's, I am good. The revelation of who I am is going to so invade the earth, I won't be limited to an hour before a message. People are going to so know me. And isn't this amazing that he's saying this? He's saying the great worship leader at the end of the age is the revelation of the glory of my name. My name will lead the nations in worship. It's from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the nations. And in every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Friends, we are in a Malachi 110 season because God's preparing the body of Christ to enter into a global Malachi 111 moment. Just to end, let's go to Malachi 3. Maybe our brother on the keys. This is Malachi chapter 3. This is Malachi 1.10. To get us to Malachi 1.11. But before you get to Malachi 1.11, you have to encounter the Jesus of Malachi 3. Friends, this whole season has everything to do with our worship. And it's time to get our worship back. And you get your worship back by, start, by getting your revelation back. Look at this, Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And, he, and now here's what happens. And the Lord... Whom you seek, 2020, will suddenly come to his temple. Come, come, Lord, come. We want you to come. We want you to come. And then he shows up and we go, no, 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 no. This isn't what we meant. Come on, stand to your feet tonight.
Oh, Lord, come. Send revival. Pour out your spirit. Send fire. And then he comes and we're like, no, 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 no. This, you missed. No, I don't think you got it. And then he says, no, I don't think you get it. We wanted revival and God's like, this is revival. So it doesn't feel like it. It's because we're not getting it yet. But what's going to happen when living rooms all over America become prayer rooms? I mean, what's going to happen? I believe, and it's the whole 111 Bentley, uh, is it, Bentley Park Drive. What's going to happen when 111 becomes the address of homes across America? Well, what's going to happen when 111, when Malachi 111 becomes the address of homes all over America? What's going to happen when God's name begins to invade living rooms? Behold, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly show up to church. Even the messenger of his covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord. Host. Verse 2, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. Verse 3, and this is where we are. And he will sit as a refiner and purifier of the worship movement. When he says the sons of Levi, he says, I am about to purify the worship of the body of Christ. I am about to purify the worship of the church. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. For what reason? To do what? So we can have our big ministries back? Oh, no, no, no. That they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. God's saying this, I just want to bring you back to the place you actually mean what you say. Right? I, I, I want to bring you back to the place it's that Right, as a deer pants for the, where the sound, where, where it isn't just a thing. You call, the sound of the pending of the deer. It's like it's a, you're not just singing it; you're living it. Verse four. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. God's cleansing us from all of our jadedness. God's cleansing us from all of our cynicism. God's delivering us from all of the sound bites, from everything that is hindered worship in the body of Christ Jesus. Guys, we are in this great purging, this great refiner's fire, this global baptism of fire. And out of this place, if we allow God to do what he's doing, we are going to see the greatest worship movement in history. And you won't hear their songs, you'll just reap the fruit. I want to tell a story and then make a call. Is that okay, Sam? The Lord told me to share this. Many years ago, uh, we were leading our school in Austin and we were just learning about this stuff. Do you guys remember when ISIS beheaded 21 Christians in Egypt? Do you guys remember that? I wasn't married yet, but I was engaged to my wife and I was researching about this and, and I accidentally found the actual video. I'll never forget this. I was so grieved and so angry. I was a good Republican. I, I still am, but I got up and I started praying. I said, God, kill ISIS, bomb them. I'm, I'm literally praying this to the Lord. And the Lord says, Jose, I have a Paul in the midst of ISIS. I want you to pray for mercy to triumph over judgment. He was, he was teaching me this stuff. And I said, heck no, I live in Texas. They'll kill me. I just, I, I'm not trying to be funny. I, I, I really thought this. But there was all principles. But listen, the very next day, I said, okay, we're going to do this. We, we turned all, all of our worship and prayer sets. We contended for ISIS, like if we were contending for our lost loved ones. It's within a few weeks. Like we were just like getting baptized into this stuff. 
And with everything, we had all the singers, all the musicians, and we're singing, God save ISIS, God save ISIS, God save ISIS. And all of a sudden, the Lord gave us a song. It was like 20 of us in a room in a little warehouse. The Lord gave us the song and we began to sing. If you can't send messengers, visit them yourself, Jesus, with visions and dreams. If you can't send messengers, visit them yourself with visions and dreams. And then, you know, it ended. Everybody went home a few weeks later. We're in the Philippines. And, and, and right before we go to start the service, I get a newsflash on my phone. And the newsflash says this. Member of ISIS that was a part of the beheading of 21 Christians in Egypt has fled ISIS and gone to Jordan and converted to Christianity because Jesus visited him in a dream. Do you hear what I'm saying? He became one of the first, if not the first informant to the U.S. government of what was happening in ISIS camps. Nobody heard us sing. Do you hear what I'm saying? I don't even, like, I don't remember who was there. I don't know what the song sounded like. No one heard us, but God moved in our worship. Friends, I'm telling you, we don't, we don't know what's coming, but what's coming is bigger than we can ever imagine. And it's not going to happen in stadiums. It's going to happen in bedrooms and living rooms. It's going to happen in small little prayer rooms and barns in Cleveland, Tennessee. But we got to get our revelation back. We got to get our revelation back. We got to get our eyes back. And God, we stop looking at you. We've become so distracted with ministry, politicians, constitution, money, success. God. Thank God David wasn't distracted with Saul. I just, I just feel like the Lord's saying over us now, He wants our eyes back. God wants our eyes back so He can give us a new song. God wants your eyes back. If you give Him your, here's what He's saying, if you give Him your eyes, He'll give you a song. If you give him your gaze, he'll give you your song. Come on, tonight, if that's you and you need to respond, I want you to respond tonight. I don't know how, what, what it is with COVID protocol. Uh, if that's you and you need to come down, I want you to come down. If you've been distracted and you want to give your eyes back to the Lord, you want to respond to this Malachi 111, and you're saying, God, I want, to, I, want you to, I want the Malachi 3 refiner's fire. I want you to refine my worship. I want you to come down tonight. We're, just, we're going to let the Lord touch us tonight. Come on, come down tonight if that's you. Come on. Come on. God forgive us. We've been so busy. Come on. Come down tonight. Come on, God. We don't want information. We want revelation. Come on, tonight. Just begin to tell them, God, I'm, God, I... I want to see you again. I want to see the glory of your name. I want to see you for myself, God. God, this is what we desire tonight. Come on, just begin to lift your voice to him tonight. Come on, just tell him, God, open my eyes again. God, just like the four living creatures in heaven. God, we pray tonight. I pray over Cleveland, Tennessee on earth as it is in heaven. Would you raise up in Cleveland, Tennessee the same worship movement, the same worship culture that exists in heaven. God, raise up a people with seeing eyes. Raise up a people with seeing eyes, God. God, I'm asking that you would mark this house afresh with Psalm 27, 4. This is what we want. We don't want to just hear about you in sermons. We don't want to just hear about you in podcasts. We don't want to just read about you in books. We want to see you, God, with our eyes, God. We want to see you with our eyes, God. We're asking you tonight, Lord, open our eyes. Open our eyes, God. We say tonight, we give you our eyes. Would you give us a song in return? Come on, let God touch your heart tonight. Let him open the eyes of your heart tonight. Just take a few minutes. Come on, I want you tonight to lift your voice to him. Come on, 
Come on, come on, don't stop. Don't, don't just be a spectator tonight. Just tell them, God, I want to see you again. Open my eyes. Come on, lift your voices tonight to him. Come on, come on. Open my eyes. Come on. Come on, baptize us in fire. Lord, come with the refiner's fire tonight. Come clean the sons of Levi tonight, God. Come with fire. Like make us like silver and gold again. Would you burn away the jadedness? Would you burn away the cynicism? Would you burn away the frustration and the disillusion that we want God again? We want to see God again. Come on, friend, don't stay silent tonight. Come on, lift your voice to Him tonight. Yeah, come on, come on. Come on. We say yes. We say yes to this season. We say yes to the refiner's fire. We say yes to being purified as gold and silver. God, awaken worship tonight. We want to worship. We want to worship God. Release Malachi 111. Malachi 111. 111 over every home tonight. 111 over every home, over every family tonight. Do it, God. Do it, God. Come on, let's go a little bit deeper tonight. Come on, let's go a little bit deeper tonight. Come on, let's get our worship back. Come on, let's get our worship back. It's time to buy oil. It's time to buy gold refined by fire. We want the oil tonight, God. We want the gold tonight. Send fire. Let's do that. Let's begin to sing in the spirit tonight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, come on. Sing in the spirit tonight. release the spirit of burning again burn away the jadedness burn away the disillusionment burn away God everything every accusation everything that stops the well of worship God and we say open up the well of worship again begin with us begin with our hearts begin with our homes begin in our marriages open up the well of worship again God Open up the wells. Open up the wells of worship.
Awaken the wells, awaken the wells. Stir it up, God. Open up the wells. Get in your heart tonight. Open up the wells. 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 Deep cries unto deep. Open up the wells. Deep cries unto deep. Open up the wells. together the oh let's do that together I am not content in Jesus name oh start a fire in my belly Lord start a fire inside of me come on it's, listen I don't want us to settle if the Bible says that we can have it let's not stop until we get it prophetic word says that we can have it let's not stop until we get it Ezekiel 1 1 and the heavens were open and I saw visions of God Matthew 13 Matthew 13 16 but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear Matthew 5 8 blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God Hebrews 12 pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Come on, December the 4th, the 5th, the 6th, and the 7th of last year, 2019. The Lord had me to do something extremely peculiar, to go on a sight fast, where I blindfolded myself for 72 hours. Why did I do that? Because there, I knew that there was something beyond the natural eye. Whatever it takes. Come on, if we have to go on a seven day fast or a 30 day, no, no, no. Just whatever it takes. I want to see you. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those that don't believe. Lord, open our eyes. Lord, open my eyes. Lord, 
Open my eyes, Lord. Open my eyes, Jesus. Come on, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, your name will be honored. Your name will be greatly pra praised. For the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, your name. Some of you are seeing something right now you've never seen before. All of it, there's more. There's more. There's more. We want more of you, Jesus. We want more of you, Jesus. More of you, Jesus. Come on, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, not every Tuesday night, but from morning till dawn, your name, Every single day, our lives, Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, for this is your reasonable service, your holy act of worship, giving your life to Jesus. I want more of you, Lord. I want more of you, Lord. I want more of you, Jesus. Ramp, family, we're never going to stop. You hear me? I had one expectation of what I thought this 30 days was going to be in, in the 30 days of worship within this 90-day season. It's, it's way different than my expectations, but so much better. Jesus, he's... He's changing our view of him. He's changing our perspective. He's changing the revelation that we have of him. Lord, we want more. We want more. Spirit's about to blow through this place.
our dreams, our desires, our ambitions, they're yours. One thing of the Lord have I desired, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I don't, I don't think I'm going to formally dismiss. I want the people who are in the altar that need to labor and not labor, but did y'all enjoy my friend Jose? Yeah. You step on your toes like